Now, all eyes on DC, no culture without agriculture is set to get started in a few minutes, all right, for the vibrations to really go throughout this room and for us to be in the mind state that we need to be in for revolution and education. I need people to move as close to the front as comfortable, okay? As close to the front as you are comfortable moving, okay? This is not a sit in the back, fool around a class type of movement. We're turning up on a Friday, but in a different way. So, if you may, please move up to the front as close as possible, if you want to. It's on you, but... With that being a fact, just as we must connect with one another and treat one another as the guys that we are, we also must connect with the earth positively and we must treat the earth as the earth has treated us well for millions of years, providing the earth, the minerals, the nutrients that we needed to keep going on our way. And understand, at a certain point before my alpha, we as African people, we were one with the earth. We understood what the earth meant to us. We gave names to the parts of the earth, the sun, and other elements of the earth. We gave them names. We treated them as gods because we understood that those earthly elements were part of an ecosystem and that each part, even though it was different, played a special part in making us whole as human beings. We were not here as people who were going to rule over the animals and the trees and the materials on the earth. No, we're here with the materials because we work for the betterment of the materials and the materials work for the betterment of us. But somewhere along the way, we forgot about that. But that's not our fault. <coughs> See, when I'm talking to my black people, I talk about white people, don't get it twisted. I talk about them all the time. But I don't say it with hate. I don't say it to the point where I'm pretty much you know, paralyzed and I can't do what it needs to be done to move forward. I talk about it in the context of our struggle. I talk to my black people, I tell them that we are in the situation that we are because of them, because they created a system in which there is one over all, instead of all for one, you understand? Then after I tell them that, I tell them with that new information, you no longer can make excuses because you know who you are as a black man, as a black woman, as an African man, African woman, as, as an indigenous person, because it's all the same, we're talking about the same melanin, the same connectivity to the earth, right? Let me get in our shade. Okay. So, what are we doing in this earthly realm if we don't understand how the earth works? If we don't tend to the earth, if we don't put our feet in the soil, if we don't put our hands in the soil, if we don't step out in the sun every once in a while, if we don't eat the fruits and vegetables that have been given to us by the Most High, if we don't go to the beach and take a dip in the water, whether it be regular water or salt water, right? If we don't actually go out with our grandparents and our parents to these farms and listen to their stories of how it was back in their day as we helped split the peas or whatever else it was, right? Come on, because talk about it, man. That's what happened to us, and we got away from that. And maybe it's because of the shame that came with my alpha and slavery. We wanted to get away from being planters or horticulturalists. Or maybe it was because of the shame that Urugu put on us. Urugu wanted us to wear suits and be in offices all day and pretty much walk around. Not saying that there's anything wrong with that, but that's not us. We were outside. We were mathematicians, we were scientists, we were outside touching the very elements that we wrote about, that we talked them about. But no, they go in these classrooms, create these prison pipeline educational institutions, and talk about nature as if you can find it in a book. Look, go outside, man. I talk to melanated kids about nature and the elements, and I've tied it together with history, with politics whole education, and they've learned more about the solar system and about nature and about horticulture than they've ever learned before because that's how our people learn. And that's how we have to keep unlocking the keys to who we are as melanated African people who tend to the earth with our own hands. Let me get in our shade. Before we move on with no culture, without agriculture, the all eyes on DC edition and what the people have called Earth Day, or Earth, or whatever they call it, Earth Day. It's coming up upon us. It was this week, right? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Thank you. This is the month where yeah. spring starts pretty much on this side, and you know you have the April showers, and you have people pretty much tending to their gardens. So it's very appropriate 
that we talk about our legacy as people. We talk about what we put on this earth. We talk about how good we treated this earth. We talk about how good we treated it because you rugu through all their propaganda machines like Time Magazine, New York Times, and, and the like. They're going to tell you that systems that were anti-capitalist were never successful. They're going to tell you that even though the Zimbabwean people yeah. took the land back from the white people who stole it, they couldn't tend to it, they couldn't produce as much. They're going to tell you that even though Fidel Castro did his thing, that people were still hungry. But they don't talk to you about the capitalism, the context in which those communistic systems tried to succeed. They don't talk to you about the forces, the United States, the other European countries that impose sanctions and play money games on their side against the people who are just trying to do right. They don't tell you about that because they want you to think that it's all for one instead of the universe being for all of us. Come on, man. Wake up, y'all. Stop being greedy, man. Tend to the earth. Love the earth more. Take a walk more. Be environmentally conscious. And if you're not there yet, trust me, after tonight you will be, because our guests, we have a nice array of guests, and once again in the spirit of being holistic and understanding the connectivity between the different disciplines, we have people who are not only ready to talk about agriculture, they're ready to talk about ancestry, they're ready to talk about culture, they're ready to talk about metaphysics in a sense, they're ready to talk about it all. So let's give them a hand, y'all. All right, let's give them a hand. The all in the building, y'all. They're all in the building. As you guys can understand, understand that the ancestors are talking through me, and I say that because I am my ancestors, and my ancestors are me. People looking at, dang, Sam's going a little crazy, but believe me, <laughs> I've been crazy in Babylon. Babylon drives you crazy. And if I don't have my ancestors, I have nobody because they laid the foundation. Just like you put the seeds in the ground, and out of that ground or the dirt comes a plant and a stalk or whatever else, I am the stuff that came out of the trees and the, and, and the soil that my ancestors fermented. So yeah. I have to recognize them, Jeez. just like Jeez. that. And they're speaking through to me. No matter what happens, we're going to keep it moving. Yeah. Special yeah. shout out to Baba Tariq Aduno. He's going to talk to us about no culture with our agriculture tonight. Let's give him a hand, y'all, please. Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> All right. We also, we have Cherie Senior, a.k.a. Hippie Chick. She's going to talk to us about organic fruits and vegetables and why we must only deal with organic fruits and vegetables. Let's give her a hand, y'all. Come on. Come on. Got my good brother in the back, Xavier Brown, the soil food. Okay, he was on All Eyes on D.C. A couple years ago when we started out at We Act Radio, he was talking about his movement to get black people back in the urban community, pretty much farming, growing for ourselves. He's going to talk about our, our work as agriculturalists and what does that mean for us ancestrally. Let's give Xavier a hand, y'all. Come on. And tonight, we got a very special informational treat. We got a sister here from Baltimore who's going to show us a special craft. If we're talking about communication, she's going to explain it. She's going to give us a little depth, and pretty much in doing, in making this explanation, she wants to encourage y'all to learn more about it and to understand pretty much how the art of communication, once you understand communication, what it can do for you. Let's give Miss Christina Cook a hand, y'all, please. Come on. All right, all eyes on DC family, y'all ready for a show tonight? Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, perfect, perfect. First to the stage, we have Miss Cherie Sayer. All right, let's, um, as she comes to the stage, we're going to read her bio. Let's give her another hand. Uh, All right, Cherie Senior. As a proud mother of the six, this woman is no stranger to a heavy workload. Instead, she juggles her duties as CEO of Ball Status Publishing, CEO of Hippie Chick, Master Gardener, co-host of the DMOS show on We Act Radio, DC hand dancer and mother with so much style and grace that her hectic life is unbeknownst to many of her peers. That's very beautiful. Very beautiful. <laughs> Telling. It was a love and appreciation for organic foods and plants that have led Cherie Senior to become a renowned master gardener. This passion has led to the formation of Hippie Chick, a company dedicated to gardening and teaching others the benefits of growing your own food. The company currently operates two gardens and produces an all-organic array of fruits and vegetables such as watermelon, cucumbers, herbs, 
beets, squash, peppers, red cabbage, and aloe vera, to name a few. That's not a few. That's yeah, yeah that'll we do. More. Cool. All right. Okay. Cool. <laughs> However, what sets hippie chick apart from others is that Sharice Senior ensures that much of their harvest is donated back to the community they serve. Sharice Senior, also the co-host of We Act Radio's Dima Show, airing on Wednesday nights, the, D- the DC-based discussion show entitled Unapologetic Table Talk dives into shared experiences of its anchors in an honest yet comical fashion that are immensely interesting for listeners. Presently, Sharice Senior sits as chair of the Green Committee of a major corporation. Her office operates out of the company's headquarters where she is responsible for the organization's green footprint. More specifically, Cherie Senior ensures that recycling programs and and waste management protocols are adhered to and followed. From candy wrappers to recycling of pens, recycling items are collected and remade into new products. Wow, okay. Despite all her many roles, Cherie Senior still finds time for her favorite, still finds time for her favorite pastime. And that's globe trotting, y'all. Let's give Sashree Senior a hand, y'all. Come on, let's do it. Oh, wow, see, you didn't get a seat. My apologies. Here you go. Sorry. Okay. No, let's I'll stand with you. We can stand together. No, all right. I'm I'm with you. Why not? My mic sounds. Good. We're letting it flow so, tonight. Let's okay. just let's just stand. All okay. right. Okay. Cool. Sharice, thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, as I explained earlier, all right, this is better. Okay. We might start doing it like this. All right. So. As I explained, you know, in previous discussions, you know, I've seen you out and about. You have your garden uh, uh, um, behind We Act Radio. You're very outspoken about eating organic foods. You know, uh, many of us who shop in these conventional stores sometimes, you know, or even just any kind of store, you find that, you know, you see less and less of fruits and vegetables with seeds. So if you can just talk to us about um, the drawbacks of eating, you know, these vegetables, <coughs> and fruits that have no seeds. So, well, first, thank you for having me, and thank you all for coming. Um, It looks good to see everybody out here, all you black, beautiful faces. So, so thanks, sir. We're gonna gonna learn a couple of quick things, and um, and you're gonna be able to take some takeaways that you can use, like, immediately. But the the basic thing is, is everything in nature uh, has the ability to reproduce itself. So if there are no seeds, there's no reproduction, then something has happened. And so that's not something that you look Genetically modified organism. If there's something that's modified, you don't want it, basically. You want the real thing. You want authenticity. And it's really just that simple. Okay, perfect. Um, and I agree, we do want, if we are talking about going back, we're talking about getting back to our principles, being authentic is one of them. Um, talk about your journey um, um, gardening organically. Uh, how did you go about finding you know, the appropriate seeds, um, compost, stuff like that? I'm sorry, I'm looking at that already. Same thing, what we see with food. The more you see variety, the more you want it. So let me just, so again, we want to take away the European mindset of having everything. Mm -hmm. We should eat based on, just like when you think of an animal, you eat based on where you are. The animal can eat what's in its surroundings, what's in its habitat. And those things are beneficial to that animal or person based on that environment. So colder climates have foods for colder climates. Warmer climates have food for, for warmer climates. So the a lion or, or is not trying to get food, that's not in its habitat because that is not going to make him optimal where he is. And of course we travel, so that's why if you travel, you can get acclimated to those foods there, but just break away the European mindset and go back to the basics and one ingredient. And really, it's that simple. You just need one ingredient, and that's it. So when you're talking about um, melanated people, people who have been scattered all around the earth, um, our diets have changed, um, you know, you already know, you know, the science shows it, the statistics about uh, diseases. We're not eating foods that are endemic to our you know, birthplace or to our ancestral home, pretty much. What is the quintessential diet for melanated people, would you say? Or, 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 or like, is there one? You know? So, so I'm gonna say again, it's based on where we are geographically. So if you're in Jamaica, 
then you really should be eating a lot of mango. That is essential to your diet in that area. And the, the what's in the mango provides you uh, what you need for that environment. So if you're in Cuba, which is kind of similar to Jamaica, so there's a lot of mangoes there. There's a lot of the smaller bananas there. Um, uh, and I just want to say this, starchy foods is a European thing. Mm -hmm. The fact that we love starch the way that we do comes from a European mindset and idea. And again, you just want to peel that back. What do you need to eat? So your vegetables and fruits, and also we shouldn't be eating those things together. If you're going to eat the, if from fruit, eat fruit. If you're going to eat vegetables, eat vegetables. Hold on. What, what does eating together do? Um, so, each, so each of them have, so I'm not a scientist, but each of them have their own properties. And so you want the properties of the fruit to do what they do in your body by cleansing and washing you out. You want the properties and the vitamins of the vegetables to do the same. So you're not supposed to combine the salads with all of the fruits and vegetables. And I, and I have to say, I have tasted them and yes, they are delicious, but it's not what's best for you and optimal for you. The best thing for you to eat in this area right here. So I can tell you because I, I live in this area. The best thing for you to eat is you, for you to wake up and have some fruit and just that just i mean something in your hand i know it's like so we have to unlearn oh first, and first let me say this get rid of the idea of eating so much yes we don't need a whole lot of food you don't need to eat three meals a day 15 million times a day and you really don't need it your body digests food 18 to 24 hours in intervals so if you're piling and compiling food then you're never having full digestion. Give your body some, that's why fasting is wonderful. And it also teaches you how to temper yourself. If you can temper yourself from food, you can temper yourself from drugs, you can temper yourself from having a bad ass attitude. You know? <laughs> yes. Cussing people out for no reason, you know? So get up and have some fruit. So I have, I still have, and I, and I have to say, I suffer from the fact that we can import fruits. Organic fruit, so I will take organic. I have to say organic in the United States with a grain of salt. Organic in the United States is not organic in, in Cuba or organic in Jamaica. But so, but we gotta do the best we can do right here, right now. So if you're gonna buy, then I would say first buy from a farmer's market. There are plenty of farmer's markets around here. Go to a farmer's market, get to know the people. So you get to know the person that's growing your food understand the energy that's connected and coming from and through your food and into your body. Second thing, you only we're only trying to eat for energy. It's not this passion filled. Yeah, yes, we enjoy it culturally. Food is always present. When we have happy moments, food is there. Food and music. It's always there. <laughs> <laughs> but get you some fruit in the morning. Um, and if you could grow it, if not from a farmer's market, if you could grow it, that would be first then from a farmer's market. If not, then let's go to the soap market and get organic. What about, so you're saying, you know, we don't have to eat three meals a day. So after you have fruit for breakfast, you know, how do you how do you go on throughout the rest of the day? Because if I'm thinking as a non-believer, I'm thinking like, yo, Sharice, man, you kind of, you know, my gut's not full. I don't feel like, you know, refreshed. You know, what? what's, what's going on here? So that's why fasting is important to kind of, you have to retrain your body. <laughs> And you know, and I know to be giving this thing, well, oh, you're gonna starve your body and then you're gonna start eating again, you're gonna shock it up, well, you're not supposed to go back to it. This is supposed to be a lifestyle change. You're supposed to understand your body and what it needs. Just like women, when you know, when it's if, if when we have our cycle, women start to crave certain things because the body is flushing and the body is telling us like we need certain chocolates. It's not that we need chocolate so much, it's that sweet that we need to fill because of the hormones draining out of us and the cleansing process that's going on. So we still need to, you still need to eat, I, I, I lost my train of thought because I started thinking about cycles and stuff and I, started going, I was about to go a whole other direction because food really does make us go, because I, um, I was just talking to a young lady or uh, she's not that young, she's 50, but she's in menopause and she has hot flashes all the time but she has an intense sugar diet. Yeah. Sugar exacerbates hot flashes. I mean, you see a woman who just tell her, hey, calm down on the sugar, the hot flashes will go away and you really don't need uh, estrogen or hormone replacement or anything like that. Just calm down on the sugar. Okay. 
a lot of information. Let, let it is a lot. Let of get straight. She, 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 she. We're gonna take a we're gonna take a short pivot, and we're gonna talk more about production. So tying back to capitalism, we're living in a jungle. Babylon, everything's pretty much mass produced, you understand? So even if me, you know, as somebody who's like, who, who, who wants to get into urban gardening, right, and I'm growing my own food, you know, how, how is it possible? Once again, I'm speaking to you, just pretend that I'm some non-believer, right? You know, Sharice, how can I go about producing enough food that will sustain me, you know, versus, you know, depending on those guys over there who have the GMO food? Man, that's such a good question. If the good thing about gardening is is that it's so plentiful. When you pick one, four more come. You know, when you pick two, there's 80 more. It's a, I, I have never had a season where I've gardened and I wasn't begging people, please take, take some of this produce, please take these cucumbers, please take this, like please take it because I don't want it to go bad and I can only eat but so much and I can only preserve but so much. But it, it, when you when you grow, so you can just get a, a container. Um, so just to give you like a, 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 an idea in your mind, like a paint container from Home Depot, let's say, and put soil in it and put a tomato plant in there. And you will eat off that tomato plant more than you need. You will have enough to say to your neighbors, hey, would you like some tomatoes? So you don't, you have to get out the idea that, you know, there's not enough because they scared us into thinking there's so many people, there's not enough food, so we have to produce it this way. It's so not true with the more you grow, the more the earth gives back to you. Wow, <laughs> that's deep, okay. Uh, let's give her a hand, y'all, let's give her a hand. <laughs> I have one more question, and this one, hopefully, um, this one's more for the, um, so once again, with the whole um, fruit and, um, and vegetable thing, especially fruit, people talk about, well, you shouldn't have, you know, too much fruit, you know, like, there's still a lot of sugar, there's a lot of rumors going around, and as far as, like, you know, vegetables, they're saying that, okay, well, you don't want too much of a good, you know, of a good thing sometimes, I'm just, um, I lost my train of thought to the beginning. So, this one speaks more to uh, what can we as audience members do today, like as far as like good sources for like you know organic seeds, you know, or just what are some you know, places you look to for seeds? So I go online and I go to a company that I can, I can I'm gonna give you the name of it so okay. you can post it. But I look for grandfather seeds and organic seeds. It's a it's a company in Virginia that's been growing seeds forever or been storing seeds forever because most people understand you know the the importance of having a seed because if the seeds are gone then it, it doesn't exist anymore it's the equivalent of an animal becoming extinct so and, and the antibodies that were built in those seeds the 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 naturalness and what was intended it becomes it, it's, it's closer to what it was in grandfather seeds from generations ago than seeds that you find now that have been manipulated. Um, it, so it's illegal to go out of the country and to bring agriculture back or seeds back. When I go out of the country, I am putting a seed in this pocket and a seed in that pocket, and I come back and I grow it. I have uh, watermelons from, um, from Los Cabos growing last year. I don't care. It's just a little seed, but it's natural. It's that's what it's for and that and that's what they do so but what you can do right now is just go to um you can go on um amazon which has been, you can't go on amazon and and look for grandfather seed something that will reproduce itself if it's gmo it will not reproduce itself if you see watermelons and there's no seed do not eat it it means it's been manipulated and that, so only thing that you would be fulfilling is just the fact that you wanted to eat watermelon, but the benefit of what watermelon does won't be present in that watermelon. Let's give Cherie Singh a thank you so much. Awesome. So, contact information, how can people get in touch with you? So, I'm at um, hippiechic.com, H-I-P-P-E-E-C-H-I-C.com. 
Um, and you're free to leave your email address. I'll get back with you. Um, I'm on social media at Hippie Chic or Cherie Senior. So um, get at me. Because anybody who wants to grow, oh, I would gladly come help you put a little something together real quick. Yes. And use it because once you see it grow, then you'll, you'll be happy. All right, y'all, let's give her a hand, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Did you guys like that? Yeah. 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 I thought it was quite enjoyable. And, you know, speaking to what I said earlier, you guys got the first third of the big pie that I'm trying to give you tonight. So, right now, we're talking about eating healthy. We're talking about, you know, geography. We're talking about ancestral lineage. Okay. And you see, that's a great segue to the second part of the All Eyes on DC No Culture Without Agriculture show. The next guest that I'm going to bring to the stage, and I'm not sure if he wants to sit down and stand up, so I'll prepare a spot for him. This man is somebody who's well known for his use of the term No Culture Without Agriculture. You know him. You've seen him around. He schooled you on a lot of history in the D.C. metropolitan area. His name is Baba Tariq Aduno, and I want you guys to give him, to give him the ovation that is deserving of an honorable elder in the community, y'all. Please, please, y'all. Baba Tariq Aduno. There is no culture without, without agriculture. My Baba Oduno says, there is no culture without agriculture. My Baba Oduno says, um, Sister Cherie, She's um, coming back. and to everyone who's here, um, you got this seat here, but I'm an athlete. Most of my life was standing on my feet. I'm probably in better shape, not because I'm talking, but because I work for it. And um, it's a pleasure being here. As a matter of fact, if the brother know that, I call it All Eyes on Africa in DC. You know, I'm always getting things kind of mixed up, but if you check it out, it's always in the loop. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to do a little wave. I'm not going to put no fire in here because we want to keep it, but we, we wave the vibe. We wave the vibe. Yes, beloved. Bob, you don't know. You, you need to have a biographical sketch on me. You're a biographical sketch. You're, you're, you're all the biographical sketch. Baba Duno, if you, just for the audience at home, if you can just talk on the mic for the rest of the segment. Um, once again, our oh, brothers and our sisters, we thank you for being here. And as it is customary, do I have the permission to speak by Almighty God? by the noble and the general ancestors, and by uh, the most mature person who is in here, who is on their way to being a junior elder. May I have the permission to speak? Yes, sir. Yes, Barbara. I don't know about you all, but it's always appropriate to be appropriately appropriate because when you do that, you honor your noble ancestors, but most of all, you are learning how to honor you. I would also like to say that 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 um, oft times too many of us like to be so secular that we are not in the Almighty. By whatever name you happen to call the Almighty or the name that you may not have. Whether you call the Almighty by Nkulu Nkulu, which is on the southern part of that particular place that they call the Zania, South Africa. Whether you call the Almighty Mungo, that is on the Indian Ocean. A whole lot of people speak Ki Swahili. Whether you call the Almighty by the name of Inyame, 
whether you call Allah Almighty by Ulud Mahdi. And all I say to you is right now, in your custom and in your tradition, because I want you to be meditating and praying or whatever your custom and tradition says with me, because we want to chase the hell out of any unfamiliar spirits that may have come in here on you while you were on the bus or driving the car. May I get a Ashe Amen? Ashe Amen. Okay. Because I'm not speaking for me, I'm just a postman. I am into speaking that's spoken, but I'm not just speaking for me. I'm on a noble team. Uh, I, did somebody say something about Earth Day? Yes, sir. Let's talk about early tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. One of the beautiful things about it, if you would uh, check this picture here of me, uh, if you would look at it at Western Washington State College in 1970, you see, uh, and it's January 5th, March of 1970. What is that, 40, 47 years ago? So when I was closer to some of you all's chronological chronologics, because I do not subscribe to the cult of the individual chronology, what I subscribe to is what you can do nobly, what you can do righteously, and even when I or you may not be in that area, what are you striving to do? Because as a junior elder who I am, and I claim if you call me an elder, that's your business. And I won't say, no, I'm not. But I am a junior elder. And what's most important is the integrity of a person. Can I get a ashe? Ashe. What is most important is the courtesy of a person. Can I get our share? What is more important is the humanity and the forgiveness of a person. Can I get our share? And somewhere near the fifth or the sixth place, it is how long you've been on the planet. Because I thank the Creator for all who are on the planet. There's some people who are some, have y'all ever ran into some old fools? Yes, I see. Well, what happened is that, what, what, what happened is that, but have you run into some older wise men and women? The wise among you will be thankful for all, because at least whomsoever they be, they give an example. Can we get an ashe? ashe. So don't ever try with those of us that there's a generation gap. There's no such thing as a generation gap among those who have a spiritual development from the heart up. What do we mean by the heart up? We're talking about those who work from the heart and the head, which is the governor of that which is down, which is the one. You've heard a bunch of lies that there's a, that there's a, that there's a generation gap, and I guarantee you the people who talk about that, whether they are youngest, whether they are middle age, whether they are oldest, whether they are peewees, they have not quite been taught the basicness that it is your spiritual direction with the heart up. Because with the heart up, you are no longer in the world only. You are not even of the world only. You're of a whole nother dimension that you are going to travel. Let me see, you don't have to raise your hands. Anybody had any relationship with the Greeks in here? Attorney and sororities, you don't have to raise your hand. I guarantee you there's one person in here. Can I get it, Ashe? <laughs> the 22nd letter of the Greek alphabet, which is C-H-I, which happens to be a four, which corresponds with Ma'at, and Ma'at corresponds to the Queen Holy Mother. Matter of fact, that is two steps above the heart. On the way to Ain Sof, the oneness, we come here to talk to you about gardening and 
agriculture. And I want you to repeat after me. Trust yourself. You don't have to trust me. I trust me. Uh, to kiss of the sun for pardon. To kiss, to kiss of, of the sun for pardon. You all sound like some students who are almost scared of yourself. Come on. To kiss of the sun for pardon. To kiss of the sun for pardon. The song of birds for mirth. The song of birds from earth. One is near God's heart. One is near God's heart. In a garden. In a garden. Than any place on earth. Than any place on earth. Go to the earth. Go to the earth. And do something for ourselves. And do something for ourselves. Even though some of us are more familiar with that, with the Nation of Islam and the Honorable Master Elijah Muhammad, and I never mention a man's name without mentioning Clara Evans Muhammad, because I don't play those games, because they are contrary to natural law and natural rights. Let me see the hand of anyone in here that you got here by a man or a woman only. Let me see your hand. So if you didn't get here by a man or a woman only, Try some time when you think of some woman or think of some man. Think of someone, a man and a woman. Because that's how you got here. How many of you are a minus nine months in your age when you talk about your chronology? How many of you deny the nine months or the seven months that you spent? We're still talking about gardening. Because there's nothing like that 9.5 month cycle. Some come seven months, some come whatever it is. Do not allow anyone. If I listened to them, I would only be a flower who would be 69. Okay? That means that I was born the 31st of August, 1947. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar just turned 70. Kathy Hughes getting ready to turn 70. Our sister Asada Shakur, guess what? Talk back to me, folks. She's getting ready to turn 70 because she's born in 47. Our brother who passed as the mayor of Jackson, Mississippi was born in 1947. Our brother Khalid Muhammad, though he was born in 1947 in January around the 12th, he was conceived uh, January 1948, when he was conceived in 1947. Our brother who was shot down in Chicago, what's the brother's name? Fred Hampton. Huh? Fred Hampton. Though he was born, his delivery date was in 1948, but he was mm -hmm. born in conceivably. Now, how many of you all have heard? We're still talking about gardening. We're talking about gardening among people. Have you ever heard somebody <laughs> tell their daughters? Do not be letting them little brothers whisper them sweet nothings in the ears. Can we get our shade? Yeah, that's called word son. I see the brothers got a smile. They look like they put a few raps down that way. Yeah, I put a few myself. Yeah, that's why I had to tell my two daughters. Yeah, see, but they used to tell her, honey, you, you cute. I had to tell her, we're still talking about gardening because you see our human capital. See, the reason why we are not able to do what we need to do in the air, earth, water, and fire, because we are a little less in the value of our human capital. I would see a CB. She said, oh, somebody said, she's cute. I said, yeah, she's cute. But guess what? It's cute. It's nice to be cute. But it's even cuter to be nice. You feel me? Can I get our shade? So you got some of them cute-looking children. You see me? You don't necessarily have to say that. But don't let people be saying, they don't mean any harm. They really don't mean any harm, usually. So well, what are we talking about in terms of this? Uh, let me give you all the quote. This is the quote. And this is the button. Any graphic artist in here? Any graphic artist in here? Anybody who know a graphic artist? Okay, good. You see this? See this button there? This button was put out back in 1982. You'll see... Some of you, that is a picture almost of a heart. And it looks almost like a heart uh, that's an indinkra symbol. And on here it says, can we say, there is, there is no culture, no culture without, without agriculture. agriculture. And since I'm on 7th and T and 1st in Atlantic, Southwest and Southeast, y'all don't mind if I say Tinkawa, T-I-N-C-W-A? 
Who picked it up? That's the acronym for there is no culture without <laughs> agriculture. Come on, folks. How did this come about? This came about because of grandmother Hester Williams Woods in Opelousa, Louisiana, on 132 acres of land. And grandfather Ephraim Woods. They were doing this. They were sustainability. They had their own beehives. They grew sugar cane. They grew sorghum. Some of it was for families and friends. The other was for the market. And my grandfather would go to the city park. He had a wagon. I never saw the wagon. I never saw him. But they kept the word going because of genealogy. How many of you all are studying your genealogy? Let me see hands, please. Okay, let's get busy, folks. Because your, your genius potential is in your genealogy. You're going to find out. Is, was it Sharice? As Sharice was talking earlier, seeds have a genealogy. I heard her say GP, right? Oh, G, yeah, yeah, GF, yeah, grandfather seeds. Okay? So but we want to talk about what they did. Because too often we want to talk about what we did. And how did I get into this garden? Everybody in our neck of the woods had a garden. They had a cutie pie garden that we call ornamentals. They had roses, brown-eyed Susans. What did you call it? Peppermint running wild. But they had uh, cucumbers, they had corn, they had tomatoes. Matter of fact, they even had what we call the three sisters of my Choctaw Creek, part of our families, many of us. What's that, the three sisters? Help me out somebody with the three sisters. Corn, beans, corn, beans, beans and squash. squash. Okay, come on, y'all kind of quiet over y'all, y'all city folks. But it's okay, it's okay. You know what I mean? That's just like if I'm trying to hold us a minute. I be trying to wet my clothes like them young people sometimes. <laughs> but it's all good, you know why? Because, because when I see them and they have their pants like that, guess what I tell them? Guess what I tell them? You think, I tell them, you think I tell them what most of you all tell them you shouldn't tell them? I said, I said, pull your mind up. They said, huh? I said, above your breath. <laughs> they don't need me. You have to think about it yourself. They don't need you in gardening or otherwise to tell them to be pulling their pants up. You have to deal, that's like what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with gardening jujitsu. First of all, giving honor to my mother, Sister Murtis, and my dad, Frank, and all the other ones, and I would be remiss of me not to give to the teachers who taught me in 4-H. How many of you all were in 4-H when you were in school? Heard about 4-H? Okay, help me out. 4-H stands for what? Help us out. Okay, can we say head, head. Hand. hand, heart? Heart. And health. health. Can we say head? Head. Hand. Hand. Heart. Heart. Health. Health. That's for age. Now, how many of you all know anyone who attended an A and I, A and T, and A and M? And what's that other? That I'm not seeing something, somebody wave if you got oh, one in the incubator. You would like to have one in the incubator? Ooh. <laughs> you, you haven't had one in the incubator? We're going to put the incubator uh, uh, call on you. <laughs> but see, the beautiful thing, the beautiful thing about this, you got to have some children. Because you're talking about gardening, you need some, you need some additional hands. But you don't do it. Do it to decent, do it to decent in the order way. Is it that's okay? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, you gotta. And so, when we when we were in elementary school, right? And guess what? We didn't have no kindergarten. Guess what they did with us in that part of the country, in Beaumont, Texas? They threw all of us into the 
first grade together. So the teacher had to teach us pre-kindergarten, <laughs> kindergarten, and first grade. But you know why she was able to do that? Miss Benson, who was one teacher, Miss Willard, who was another teacher, I was in Miss Benson's class, because they had had a normal education. You know what a normal education is? Homeschool. Huh? Homeschool. Well, yes, yeah, homeschool. <laughs> How many of y'all been homeschooling there? Now, don't lie to yourself. How many of y'all been homeschooled? And don't lie on your mama, because when you spent them nine months in your mother's womb, talk to me. And when, when you spent them nearly six, six years at home, and guess what? I don't know about you. I'm sitting right on top of 70. I'm still homeschooled. I'm still trying to deal with some lessons of my mama and my daddy, because this is all with the gardening thing. And let me share this with you. In the schools, there was not a school that didn't have a garden. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm glad I went to Miss Valley Thomas in the third grade. She was the bomb. What I mean by Miss Valley Thomas? She told the boys, she said, I, you can bring anything to school except poison snakes and poison ivy. So what do you think we boys did? See, when, when some of us came up, and, and that's why some people went back to homeschooling. How many of you all have built a dog house, a cat house, a doll house, a tree house? If you were growing up in some places in the world right now, and you're talking about you're a young man, at a minimum, you would have been hooked into building what? A tree house. And there were two kind of tree houses. Okay? Because we would go back in the place and pick wild persimmons and wild figs and get stung the hell out of ourselves trying to steal the honey out of the beehive without knowing what to do. And so what happens is that we have to meditate and pray for gardening to be a part of the culture. We just can't come out, and please forgive me for this, we just can't come out in, in December and talk about Kwanzaa means the seven, Kwanzaa means the fruit of, uh, what, 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 what do we say? Come on, help me out. The first fruits of the harvest, right? Uh -huh. uh, let me see the hands of you all who know what has a Kwanzaa form anywhere in the last 51 years. What has a Kwanzaa form that's called Kwanzaa. So why are you practicing it? After 50 years, I mean, we'll be that slow. But anyway, I see some people out in the audience. Some of us met with bugs in, 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 in Detroit. And I'm thankful that uh, somebody, uh, I'm the class of 93 at UDC. I'm talking about the Master Gardener class. When Al Wilkins was there, and the other Al was there. And when I was taking the class, I was working out with our brother. Brother M. Shazazi Axum, who he's, he's kind of staying in the recess, but he's always working. And so, but Brother Axum, you ought to know his name just like you, just like you know some, what's the hip hop? Oh, you know, well, if you know two or three of the top hip hop persons in D.C., if you know the top two or three rhythm and blues people in D.C., uh, I don't think y'all deal with too much uh, medical marijuana, but if you know the top three medical marijuana people in D.C., mm. you ought to know Brother Yao and other people who are on that scene at the Agricultural Experimental Station at Beltsville that's connected to the University of the District of Columbia. And Bob, I, you know, yes, that, yes, sir. No, no, that's out there on uh, Power Bell. I, I know how to catch the metro to the green belt, and then they come pick me up. If that's out that way, that's how I get out there. I'm about to pass that today. Yeah, see, Bob, see, one thing about, well, one thing about not so much just Bob Oduno, whoever you are, we, we were taught, and just like you were taught, you got to learn how to do things with or without certain resources. Because if you wait for the resources to attempt to do something, guess what you're going to be doing? Twirling your thumbs and sitting on your hand. 
That's not what my mm -hmm. teachers taught us. And so I'm held to you from the Pacific Northwest also, from Seattle, Washington. I would hope some of these days, but it's crazy now. It used to not be that crazy, and I'm not talking about Seattle, Washington. I'm talking about Fort Collins, where the International Seed Bank is. We should know where the nearest seed bank is that's near us. I'm talking about our seed bank, because we need to start talking among ourselves and this is one of the few times, I mean, I know some connections in Detroit, connections in Philadelphia, uh, bugs in uh, New York, Brooklyn, um, the people who are in Atlanta, uh, Kashan, uh, uh, Ross Kashan, and Hodar Ali's brother, uh, Nuri Rashid, I know the seed woman who way out there on the West Coast, and there are many others. But you see, if you make this a ritual, like we have made Kwanzaa, we will not leave to ourselves and to our children what we're supposed to do. Just like we like to go down to the chateau. This may not be the chateau generation, but we, we go where we go. Okay? I don't even I don't worry much about dance places. But see, the beautiful thing about it is that, and guess what? I just took a class. I just took a class here. Let me see this. I just took a class in here. Y'all give yourself a hand. I just, a certificate of completion. Beginning beekeeping course. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And when you see me doing this, I'm thankful for you all's applause, but, but I'm saying all praises due to the almighty God and to the noble ancestors. I'm thanking you. I, it's not that I'm casting off what you've said, but there's an order for some of us. Now, guess what I got to do? I got to spend 40 hours under someone who's been beekeep, backyard beekeeping. Um, 40 hours, because all I did was did the paperwork. Yeah, we went through the handling, the, uh, the this and the handling that, you know, in, in the beekeeping, and putting on the, putting on the beekeeping equipment. Uh, but if you want to do beekeeping later on, there's the Franciscan monastery that has bees. There's uh, yeah. huh? I'm in that program right now. Amen. That, free. Yeah, there's a there's a there's the botanical garden that has to be. Let me tell you something. If you want something in in DC, you can find it. You, you know why you can find it? Because if you notice, I haven't said nothing about them other people, right? Whoever those other people are, right? Because you see, charity begins at home. See, I don't have to talk about them other people because I'm at that level of development. Oh, I kick their assets. All the way to the Hoover Dam. Isn't that, isn't that right, Come on. Yeah. Because sometimes I kick yours and sometimes you kick mine, huh? And it's all right because he wants to kick me forward. Is that okay? Can we get our shape? Our shape. You know, but we shouldn't do that with those who are not as strong, okay? Hmm. But for those who have a little strength, you know, let's, 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 let's step it up. And uh, this is a beautiful thing. And so... What I would like to suggest to you, especially for those of you who participate in Kwanzaa, let's see if we can encourage ourselves to do sprouting. Sprouting is a simple process. Some of us sprouted in the second, third grade. Let me see, fourth grade. Anybody sprouted beans? Beans? Took a, took a sweet potato? Took a sweet potato? Or oh, Irish, Irish potato? Guess what? We can help ourselves by helping the young children by making it a policy because you want them to be surrounded by green. How many of you hugged a tree today? <laughs> Hug a tree. You know what the Japanese, no, I, I'm not supposed to be talking about other people, but anyway. Uh, but anyway, <coughs> I didn't hug a tree today, but I hugged trees. Yeah. You know why, you, you know why I hug trees? They got a lot of spiritual sense. They got natural sense too, because uh, does everyone know the difference in uh, a, a deciduous plant and an evergreen plant, huh? Yeah. A, okay, if you don't know, raise your hand. Okay, that's fine, amen. Okay, one loses its leaves, right? That's a deciduous. Evergreen keeps its plants, keeps its seeds or cones or what have you. Right outside when you come in here, that's evergreen, that's a holly. Now, if you go to Howard University or any, or almost any college or university or church, you will find evergreen trees planted out in front of them, why? Have you ever thought about that? That's because plants keep the light on. Plants keep the oxygen up. Plants are our older sisters, brothers, and others. 
So this is what. Um, let me just let me shut down. Let me shut down on this by saying, uh, since Gaylord Nelson, that's the only reason why I called his name. Yeah, yes, ma'am. That's Dr. Nanny Helen Burrows. Y'all see me? I got all kind of Nanny Helen Burrows on me. Lord, come on, get a close up. Anytime somebody can get six acres of land in 1909, I ain't not just her. The sisters pull it off in the same way. In the same way that uh, Osset got together with the sisters, and what did they do when the brother helped to put the other brother in the coffin and helped to chop the brother up? And what did the sisters do, y'all? Come on, talk to me. She put it back together. Okay, well, was it only the one sister or was it the sister crew? The sister crew. Oh, amen. Can we get our shake? Our Okay, let's not talk that individualism, even though every tub got to sit on its own bottom. Does everybody understand that? That yeah. means that you got to do you. But you can't do you so much that you don't do the crew, okay? Okay, do me, 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 but don't do so much me that you cannot do we, we, we. Okay, that's how plants do things. Also, quickly, when you go around the African American, what they call that, the new, the new thing, the African American Museum, how many of you all looked at the landscape? Does that look like does it, does it look like African descendant landscape? I mean, really? Okay. Well, just meditate and pray. And if you got some connection, we're gonna give them 120. We're gonna give them another 120 days, okay? Okay. But if you go around the Native American Museum, what do you see growing over there? The three sisters. Matter of fact, they got the nerve enough to have some kale greens over there. I passed by there two or three days ago and passed by there last week. I saw all these yellow flowers. You know what I mean? Mm, they gotta have some greens over there somewhere. Y'all know plants buy flowers. You shouldn't have to walk up on them. If you buy a pear tree, guess what the color of the flower is? Look at the tree. It'll tell you. Usually it's white. Okay? Pay a little bit more attention. You, you, ain't nobody asking you to dig in the dirt because we're not talking about dirt. We're talking about soil, right? And soil is connected with the soul. And it's the soul that is to become behold. Mm. But guess what? We'll take, Xavier, we, we'll take the dirt, right? Yeah. And we'll turn it into what? Soil. We'll turn it into soil. Help us out. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what we'll do. So stop complaining about people. Let me tell you something, and I'm going to take my seat. God willing. Yeah. We have, we, we have, <laughs> we have, we have, we have, uh, we have about five kind of people. Let me start with the don't give a dog, okay? I didn't say don't give a ham. I said don't give a dog. But the don't give a dog is the disciples of gardening. Oh, y'all, hey, disciples of what? Gardening. How about that? Don't give a, don't give a dog, okay? <laughs> now, you have the ones who are trailblazers. You have the pioneers. And you have the visionaries. And guess what? I didn't name one. The bandwagoners. You know who you all belong to mostly, but guess what? Between all the gardeners in here, or would-be gardeners, we're going to give you a pass today, right? You are an honorary gardener, okay? Now, if we see you next year, and you're not doing something one way or the other, we're going to have to throw you out of the gardening club, okay? <laughs> but the reason for it is that the bandwagoners, the visionaries are the ones who do things way in advance. Mm -hmm. Many people who know Baba Oduno, mm -hmm. you know, I've been doing gardening in Texas, gardening in Seattle. I moved to Denver, Colorado. If you knew of Daniel Mews and Rennell Mews and Dr. Bookhart, we did gardening 40 miles outside the city. I came to Washington, came to Washington, D.C. with the Osara Set Society, and it would be remiss of me uh, when I was teaching in the Nation of Islam in between 1971 and 74, almost 75, reading, writing, and arithmetic in the school was not separated from the A, B, C's of gardeners. Can you say with me? Attitude. Attitude. Behavior. 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 Character. 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 Since we're in a no culture without agriculture, let's put something, let's say agriculture. Agriculture. Botany. 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 Chemistry. Chemistry. 
Let's say it again. Agriculture. Agriculture. Botany. 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 Chemistry. Chemistry. Less. Less. Change. Change. My. My. Attitude. Attitude. Behavior. Behavior. The character. Character. About. About. Agriculture. Agriculture. Botany. Botany. Chemistry. Chemistry. Okay, you know, you, you, you know how to do this because you know what you do well. Mm. And so Gaylord Nelson in 1970, but our people were always doing it. Mm. And I'm going to say the three C's. You know what the three C's are? The three C's are George Washington Carver, the Columbia <laughs> Exposition of 1893, and Amilcar Cabral, O Povo Organizado, Aluta Continua. That means that in order for the people, in order for the people to uh, do something, they have to be organized. So the people under 40, the people who feel under 40, under 30, under 20, we have to organize in ebony. I know there's a lot of there's a lot of people in DC who do gardening, but I'm hoping to the noble ancestors. To the Emily Grayson Merritt, who went to Merritt Middle School? Anybody went to Nanny Helen Burroughs School? Anybody went to any school named by a black woman in this city? Any city? You know, it's a lot of schools in this city named after black women. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, Nanny Helen Burroughs, you see me, I'm, you know, like, you know, I'm, I mean, you see my head, you know, six acres of land, you know, I'm going to hang out with them folks. Is that okay, Sheree? That's all right. Yeah, six, six acres of land, you know, 52nd and, and Nanny Helen Burroughs. Those women had a, they had a Texas, a Texas lot. A Texas lot is roughly 75 by 150. 75 across, 150 deep. That's the kind of a garden that they had on that property. Mary McLeod Bethune. She had a garden in her backyard uh, on Vermont Avenue, and I don't know what she had down at Daytona Beach. Charlotte Hawking Brown. I did say something about the three B's of education, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if I didn't say it, that's Charlotte Hawking Brown, Mary McLeod, Bethune, and Nanny Hubbard Burroughs, 1902, 1904, and 1909. Now, the reason why I say them is that uh, as Mimi Fuller and Dr. Francis Chris Wilson gave us to the nine areas of human activity, is that an amen? Amen. Okay, well, I'm not that smart, so I'm going to just stay with the three. Is that okay with you? That's okay. Is that okay? Okay. We're going to stay with education. Education. Economics. Economics. And entertainment. Entertainment. Did you get a little entertainment up here today? Yes. You know, it's always nice to have humor. And when you look at Dick Gregory, just like that system with, just like the system with Assar, Dick Gregory was helped out by a sister by the name of Albania Fulton, who had a health food store on East 69th Street in Chicago since 1953, and she lived all, in all, all the way up to 1990. So if you look at Dick Gregory's book that's called Cooking with Mother Nature, the second chapter you will see he talks about Dr. Albania Fulton. If you look over here, and somewhere in here they got some books how to eat to live, okay? And then a whole lot of other folks I know over the What's the book? You know, I don't like to call them other people's names, but sometimes we give them a little play. Uh, Jethro <laughs> Kloss. Help me out, somebody. Uh, come on, Jethro Kloss. Come on, come on. This is a whole other genre. But anyway, just take it. Plug in Jethro Kloss. And so, my brothers and my sisters, this is a way of life. And all of us have our slice. We got any musicians in here? We got any singers in here? Because, uh, Hey, Brother Xavier, tell them. All we want you to do is to take your D shoes off. Bring your musical instrument, bring your dancing shoes into me, and the plants and the flowers mm -hmm. love you mm -hmm. to do what you do. And guess what? You're going to find out that you're going to like what they give back to you. How many of you all have looked at the secret life of plants on the video? The secret life of plants. All right, good. Give us an amen for the amen corner. Amen. Okay. Uh, there's also a book by Peter Tompkins. And then I don't want to give you too many. The reason why I mentioned the DVD because I know some generations don't read as much. And that's okay. Because there are other ways to access data and information. What's most important, most important about it is the practice. Okay. Somebody help me out. 
The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. What, what, what's that saying? Huh? Talk to me, huh? Yeah, that means that, mean that you have a responsibility through your giftings to be a custodian of first and foremost your own earth, which is called your body. From the crown of your head to the sole of your feet, back to your fingertips. And brother, I would just like to do this prayer right quick and then I'm going to sit down. This is a prayer that they would always do within the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Community League. And I am striving to be on my way to Atlanta, at least tomorrow, on a bus, hook or crook, so I can be there at least by 9 p.m. on Sunday. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. God of the right of our battles, fight, be with us at the war. Break down the barriers of might we rapidly implore. Spread confusion ever o'er the advocates of might. And let them know that righteousness, righteousness is mighty than sin. That sin is only selfishness and cannot ought not win. In thou us in Yame, Kulunkulu, Mungo, all of them, that we shall never be the same once we leave outside this building. And we will do our best to touch additional young men and women. All the men and women, I should say younger men and women. Because it is our time over. And it's for us to get up and do something for ourselves by going to the earth. We want to honor our great great grandparents predominantly. Guess what we have to do? We have to provide our own food, clothing, shelter, mental health, psychological health, economic health, war health, legal health, sex health. Can I get an ashe? Ashe. My brothers and my sisters, thank you very much for your time. And I'm honored to be here with you. And I'm overly honored to be with the gardeners and all of you who are parents because you parents are helpers of parents because you are gardeners in your own right. Can we get our shade? Our shade. One God. One God. One aim. One aim. One destiny. One destiny. Africa for the Africans. Africa for the Africans. At home. At home. And abroad. And abroad. You see, I don't need a mic. <laughs> Let's get my oh. Now I'm pretty sure you could have gotten this lesson anywhere in the city where Bob Duno, you know, where you and him, you know, cross paths. But it's very appropriate that we brought this message here tonight. And if you guys, you know, didn't notice, at a certain point, I just stepped to the side because Bob Duno just does his thing pretty much. You know, he has a message. We talked on the phone. I told him, listen. We're talking about no culture without agriculture. And tonight, he laid down the law pretty much. If you think he laid down the law, <laughs> let me get in our shade, y'all. Okay. Man, he pretty much laid down the law. And I, you know, and quite honestly, I love how you tied pretty much agriculture with genealogy and how you're talking about legacy. And you know, and I'm pretty sure that all of us here will do it upon it, will make will make it a point to make our grandparents and our ancestors proud, y'all. So once again, for those of y'all who just came in, my name is Sam P.K. Collins. Tonight, with all eyes on D.C., we're talking about no culture without agriculture, okay? Just a little recap. First, we had Ms. Cherie Singer. She talked about eating organically, fruits and vegetables, pretty much. Just now, we had Bob Duno talking about culture as it relates to agriculture. Last, our last all eyes on D.C. guest, as far as interview-wise, is... Uh, Mr. Uh, Xavier Brown, please give him a hand, y'all. And I'm going to give him a second to decide whether we're sitting or standing. You know, we standing? All right, cool. I like this trend. So, uh, Xavier. Xavier Brown is a native of Washington, D.C., and a graduate of the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Beautiful. He operates at the boundaries of urban agriculture, environmental sustainability, and African diasporic culture. 
is work intertwined sustainability with the issues that impact stressed communities from gun violence to mass incarceration. By studying the practices of indigenous people and going back to ancestral knowledge, Xavier is creating a new sustainability movement that's healing the people and the land by reconnecting our sacred relationship to the earth. He's doing it through soil food. So anybody who knows Xavier knows that he's very serious about agriculture and he's very serious about ensuring that our people uh, can do for self as it relates to the earth. Let's give him a hand, y'all. Let's give him a hand, y'all. So Xavier, like, a, like, a, like I told the audience before, this is not your first time on the show. Uh, that was back in April, might have been, yeah, July 2015, from what I recall, July 2015. So, you know, we're almost up at two years. Can you talk to the audience a little bit about what's happened since then as far as your relationship with the earth and just the people in D.C. and all that? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me here. Um, thanks to Bible Benny, Sharice. Um, yeah, so since uh, we first talked initially, um, I'm part of a black farmers collective called the Black Death Farm Collective. Last year, we hosted our first agroecology encounter on the eastern shore of Maryland on, uh, so here at Tubman's ancestral grounds. So it was like 80 people, black folks, Latino folks, and Vietnamese folks, and we camped out there for three days and had a real uh, kind of amazing. <laughs> since then, um, I got a soulful kind of website going. Um, I did a bunch of stuff. Uh, Went to Puerto Rico, had an agroecology encounter. Um, I've done a whole bunch of stuff. I, I oh, it's, it's beautiful, you know, and like that's the beautiful thing. We're just going to talk a little bit about that. So, you know, in these experiences, what did it tell you about ancestry, you know, as it relates to agriculture? You know, our previous guests, they touched on it a little bit, but I want to, you know, get your twist. How did, how, how did you reconnect? to what our ancestors did on these trips. You know, you talk about Harriet Tubman's place, and you also talk, you know, just talk a little bit about that place. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, so like the agroecology gathering, one of the big things was we were on Harriet Tubman's ancestral grounds, and, and we just talked about, uh, we talked about her from the lens of being like an environmentalist. Because when she was doing her runs on the Underground Railroad, they were at, at night in, in the wintertime, and so she had to be able to navigate the wilderness by the stars, by the plants, by whatever, you know what I'm saying? She was an outdoors woman, and so um, kind of looking at her through that lens of being really an environmental uh, feminist, a womanist, or whatever you want to call her, a warrior, um, and being able to kind of um, do that. So that's that's one of the things. Um, so the Black Death Farm Collective, and I actually put it in my phone, we came up with a, uh, a concept called Afroecology, and I'll read the definition. Um, <coughs> So, Afroecology uh, is a form of art, a movement, practice, and process of social and ecological transformation that involves the reevaluation of our sacred relationship with land, water, air, seeds, and food. <coughs> we recognize as humans as co-creators that are in that are an aspect of the planet's life support system, values the Afro-Indigenous experience of reality and ways of knowing cherishes ancestral and, and communal forms of knowledge, experience, and life ways that began in Africa and continued throughout the diaspora and is rooted in the agrarian traditions, legacies, and struggles of the black experience in the Americas. So we came up with Afroecology. We hosted three uh, Afroecology trainings in D.C. We had one over in Clay Terrace. We had one um, over at the Ark Farm in Southeast. And we had one down in Southwest at the Dreaming Out Loud uh, micro farm. And let's give him a hand, y'all. That sounds really cool. That sounds really cool. You know, it sounds like, you know, it sounds like Xavier, you've taken your work to the next level. You know, because describe it for me. You know, now you're looking at it differently. You, you know, you've developed a whole, um, like a whole concept around it. You know, and of course you've been doing this for a long time, but you're still teaching it to the same people. You know, how 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 have you been able to, you know, um, show urban farming in that frame, you know, how has that been showing it to our people, you know, some, you know, some people, you know, who, 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 who might not be aware of their connection to the diaspora, you know, let alone, you know, or, or people who might not have the resources that they need to get the proper nutrients. How do you, you know, bring that, that type of knowledge to them, you know, 
through the prism of agroecology? Yeah, so um, I think Clay Terrace is a good example. We work um, primarily one of my biggest community partners is, is a brother who came home from incarceration, this guy named Bo. And he, have, he and I have worked together. He has like the social capital in the neighborhood from doing a lot of negative things, but he kind of uses that same social capital to kind of do some positive things. And so he and I have really partnered together to kind of reinvigorate this community garden that was constructed a few years ago by an organization uh, that came from outside the community. So really just working with the community and working with people like where they are and finding it could be one or two people that are interested but building from there. And just like the people who came before me said that like once people see things growing, it attracts people. So once somebody gets a watermelon straight from the garden or some tomatoes are always a good thing because um, they, they taste so much better. Um, it kind of pulls people in. Once see people see positive activities going on in the neighborhood, uh, it's like a magnet that pulls people in, pulls people in. And so it's a slow process, just like growing food, but it's working. So the easiest thing is like, you know, actually growing the food in the garden. The hardest thing is, is the community part, and working with people um, and kind of break down uh, trauma, work through trauma. And this is different systems that are kind of what are some hindrances in doing that? People, they might, you know, have busy schedules, um, you know, community buy-in, you know, how, you know, as far as, you know, just getting all hands on deck, you know, you said, and I think I know Bo as well, um, yeah, okay, very good, because he's, cause he's on this side too sometimes. Yeah, he is a uh, government Okay, cool, cool. So, you know, just as far as like, you know, that community buy-in, yeah. um, <laughs> How can we apply that model to other places around the city? You know, because the work you're doing, the work that Sharice Senior's doing, and the work that Bob Laduno's doing, and charging us to take our life into our own hands. You know, I I, I really want to you know see us you know take this vision to the next level. So how do we create a network? You know, where people are sort of like on the same accord about you know urban farming and you know and really taking an inventory of places that are food deserts that might not have those resources yet. You know, are we are we on our way to doing that, you know? I think we are in a way. Yeah. Uh, Bob O'Doodle mentioned a little bit about the Bugs Conference. Okay. So I was up there in Detroit with him, I think like three years ago. But Bugs is like Black Urban Growers, and it's a conference that they host every year, and it bounces around from city to city. So this year's gonna be in Atlanta. So there are, on a national level, black people that are connected, and just a local level, I think, um, so after the agroecology kind of encounter we had in, in Eastern Shore, we had a DC agroecology group of people from this area that went and we started to organize together. But we need like more people. Because like you mentioned, there are areas in the city that are food insecure, with the black areas in the city, more seven and eight, while the black people live. So three grocery stores on the inside, side, the entire side of town. Um, and just to kind of put that into perspective, there's two grocery stores, like three blocks from each other on H Street Northeast, and that's more than the entire War 8 has. So when you think about it, they have a giant and they have a Whole Foods that are like literally three blocks from each other. And War 8 just has like a Safeway or a giant. So just like, um, we need more organizations. There's people that are working to kind of start a, 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 a worker on food co-op in the city, but they need more, more support. And um, I think it's probably more on us, the organizers, to figure out ways to like connect with the people and give them ways to support. Everybody was supported, just need the, the avenues to support. I definitely agree. I like the work that you've been doing. You know, you've been really involved in the uh, sustainability movement in DC. Uh, just digging deep, more deeply into, ag into Afroecology, you know, so when you're talking about that, uh, how does that translate into your treatment of the materials needed? You know, so as far as like you toiling the you know, going to the soil and stuff like that. How does that translate to that? Do you handle the soil a certain kind of way, you know? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, Africa is just basic natural farming practices that Baba Luni did when he was younger, she does. It's just natural, everything is natural. So not even using the word organic, it's just natural. The system's kind of co-opted that word, you know? So I agree. it's just, just straight natural is, is how we doing it, you know? Um, I have to ask, like, how, you know, how do you get that natural, you know, I'm speaking as, you know, I, I'll admit, you know, um, I'm a novice when it comes to the gardening thing, you know, DCPS, they had gardening programs back when I was younger, but it's been about 20 years since I've done that. So, you know, how, you know, how do we, when, you, when you're talking about natural, you know, like myself, when I do start my own garden, I want to stay away from, like, the pesticides and all 
way. So like, what are what are what are alternatives when you're talking about all aspects of gardening? You know, what are some natural remedies? You know, for pesticides. What are some natural ways to even handle the other aspects? If you get what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I dig it. And so I think the first thing is just to look at like what like God or whatever you, you believe in is already created. So if you go out to like Rock Creek Park or Oxymoron Park, how does it, how is it already naturally set up? You know what I mean? It's a diversity of like life. It's, everything is diverse. You have big trees, some smaller trees, some ground cover. So you really just try to replicate what's already naturally available. And that's, that's what you kind of think of. Like God has already created the, the, the kind of framework. How can we kind of recreate that? And that's like the process of just natural farming. How can you kind of put yourself into the system that's already working? You know, so it's, you're not even really, the plants are going to grow on their own. You can't make the plants grow. You know what I mean? You can't hold the seed in your hand. The plants are going to grow on their own. How can you kind of work in that process? You know what I'm saying? So you have composting, like she mentioned. You're going to have flowers, which is going to be like your biodiversity, and the flowers are going to bring your, say, uh, ladybugs, for example, who eat other pests. And so it's just about that. <laughs> so there's a lot of different methods. You can make biofertilizers, and you can find a lot of stuff, probably some stuff, you add some elders in your, in your family, they did some stuff that, you know, um, that, that, you know, so it's, it's just, everything is already there. It's just kind of like tapping back into it and talking, speaking with people like Bob Ogunu, or maybe speaking with some elders. South, but if the game is there, you just got to kind of tap into it. But everything is laid out. Laid out so. Man, let, let's give Xavier, you know, a hand. He's giving us some really good information so far. Uh, he's, touching, he's touching on various aspects, you know, of the you know of the gardening game as it relates to our ancestral heritage. Uh, I have to ask um, because you know you speak about you know the mainstream co-opting this word organic. Yeah. You know, if you could just give us a as best you can. A, uh, give us a historical overview, at least recently, of this whole sustainability movement. Why is it that the, that the mainstream is just catching on? When did the mainstream just catch on? Like, what is it that got people all in the frenzy now about you know urban gardening and clean gardening and being sustainable? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would have to say, from my perspective, I know Michelle Obama. She kind of popularized the, the Let's Move campaign, kind of, and it kind of blew up. Um, after that, I think, uh, but I think there's, for black folks, at least for my generation, there's like a renaissance going on. And so like the more, you'll see a lot of, wherever you go, there's more people in their 20s and their 30s getting back in touch with the land, growing food. If you go to the Buzz Conference in Atlanta, you'll see a lot of people that look like everybody in this room growing food. I was in Puerto Rico like two weeks ago at a farm training. There's a lot of young Puerto Ricans there growing food. Um, and so it's like a, a, a renaissance going back. So people are getting reconnected with nature on their own terms, and that's what kind of Afroecology is about. Because during the transatlantic slave trade, we were connected. You know, we were connected with nature on somebody else's terms, on an abusive term. Mm -hmm. You know, and so like my homegirl said, we kind of confused what happened to us on the land with the land itself, and so we wow. kind of mm -hmm. disconnected from the land and the wisdom of nature and all that type of stuff. But I think people are kind of coming back to it and realizing that. We can't prosper without the land and what the land gives us, you know. So, so how yeah. feasible do you see that happening? And okay, fine. So how so so how feasible is that in the city? You know, of course you're making you know you you're making leaps and bounds. Of course, you know I'm not taking that away from you, but like this is the city. You know, we have you know not not really skyscrapers, but the environment. You're talking about just everything being close proximity. You know, the fumes of the metro buses, cars, the noise. The construction, you know, how, you know, in getting back to the earth, even with us growing our own stuff, you know, just, you know, beyond that, you know, are we are we really getting back to our ancestral plane? And, you know, if not, then how close can we get? I think we need to, um, and like what we're working with Black Dirt is realizing that you have to have like an urban rural connection. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So it can't just be an urban thing because, like you said, in DC, gentrification and displacement. So any vacant lot of corner, kind of going up, like. Like that, so it's kind of hard to compete with that. A garden's not going to outcompete a, a, a store, you know. So um, having that urban-rural connection, and in places in PG County, land is available. You know what I mean? And I think right now, one of the big discussions that we've been having is that there's currently like a big land grab, and a lot of elders, you know, like elders are, are had to have land 
don't have anybody to pass the land on to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's, that's something true. that we need to you know, talk about. This land is important, even though, you know, yeah, land is important. So um, that might be one of the most important things, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So just having those, but the urban rural, I think, connection is, is key. You can get people started in D.C., you know, in Southeast or Northeast somewhere, and then they can go to Upper Marlboro, mm -hmm. North Carolina, somewhere, Georgia, wherever, and carry that on, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, when I was in Puerto Rico, I had the opportunity to meet uh, this guy named Ben Burkett and this other guy named Charles, and they're from the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. Y'all should check them out. They're pretty dope. They're the oldest uh, black cooperative maybe in the country, at least black farm cooperative in the country. It's their 50th year anniversary, and they have, like, from, like, no Carolina on down, they have farm cooperatives. Um, and he told me about how they do the, the uh, water, seedless watermelons, and it was it's an interesting process of how they... They breed them. They're not GMO, but they like inbreed them, inbreed them, inbreed them until they don't you know, have seed anymore. It's like a real interest. But um, yeah, but just like just connecting with people like that because one thing he said is that there's not enough young people for them to pass their stuff on to, and they have a lot of so we need to make those connections with our elders and make the urban rural connection. So uh, urban agriculture is not going to save us, but I think getting outside of the city and making those connections. <coughs> Yeah, and I, you know, I agree, you know, and of course, you know, in the spirit of All Eyes on D.C. being what it is, we give pieces of the puzzle every month. Yeah. Your piece of the puzzle is a very important piece because, you know, once we do break away, we sort of have to, we have to do for self. You know, we have to eat, you know, just because you broke away, you know, the enemy has the food. So, you know, how are we going to do it? You know, um, this conversation that we're having, we're building in front of an audience. It just brought to mind another question. You know, I don't have the statistics in front of me or in my head, but you know, I have to ask you: Do you see sort of like a like a reverse migration of black people back down toward the south? Because I even think about my friends who I went to school with. I'm, I'm celebrating. We're we're having our ten year reunion like very soon. You know, Banneker right down the street, and you know, a lot of a lot of our friends, you know, they went to school in the south, other places, and they never came back. So I'm trying to figure out, you know. You, you you might not be an expert, but like, do you see sort of like this, this like reverse migration of DC folks back down in the south? And if you do, like, you know, what what can that say about us as far as like owning land again and you know just yeah. reconnecting with the earth? Um, I sure it might be because the cost of living was cheap. Greensboro mm -hmm. cost of living was yeah. like super cheap compared to DC, so that could be a big part of it. You know, um, it's hard to live up there in DC. So that could be a big part of it. But um, I, I think there's a, opportunities for like collective land ownership. Um, Bob Odunu, I don't know if you know him, see him now, but he mentioned, uh, he didn't say his name, but he mentioned Chokwe Lumumba, the mayor of uh, Jackson, Mississippi, who yeah. died. But it was a brother who went to Puerto Rico with us from Cooperation Jackson. That's a dope organization y'all should check out. But they have been able to buy it like vacant properties in the city and are doing some real dope things. So I think everything about like cooperative land, Ownership models and things of that nature. Uh, it's, it's, it's options out there for us to take. Um, but I think I definitely think now is like the right time, to like you know, to get some land. If not now, then when? I agree. If not now, then when? You know, wise words to end on. Uh, I want everybody here. You know, please give your, you know, please continue to give your undivided attention. But please give Xavier Brown a soulful, a big round of applause. Show your gratitude. Uh, you know, brother, if you could just leave the audience uh, with some contact information, you know, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Uh, just, um, I got some cards in my pocket. But a soilfulcity.com or XW Brown at Soilful City, so S O I L F U L, like soil and soul, kind of put together. Yeah, um, yeah. City. real creative. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's it. All right, family, let's give them another hand, y'all. Let's give them another hand. Thank you. Um, before, we, uh, before we bring on the, uh, the, the enrichment part of tonight's festivities, you know, I just want to uh, shortly, briefly, rather, I want to briefly reflect on what we just experienced here tonight. Uh, as always, all eyes on DC in the spirit. In the spirit of informing people and pretty much, you know, giving a call for self-determination. 
all eyes on DC. It was it was very important that we had to do this today because there's nothing more important than sustaining yourself through food. There's nothing more important than it. You know, you can talk all the politics, all the law, you know, that you want. You can talk all about finances and all that, but food is the most important thing. Food is how they're killing us today, right? Food is the food is pretty much when you're talking about the hierarchy of needs, you know, food is pretty much up there, you know, along with air, you know. So it's important. Well, especially water, exactly, right? All the essentials, all the vitamins, all the nutrients. So if we're really talking about being free, we have to talk about where we're getting our food from. So I really appreciate you guys, you know, for coming out here tonight, you know, investing your Friday night. Not sacrificing. Nothing is a sacrifice. I like speaking about investments. It's not a sacrifice. Sacrifice means you didn't want to do it. It means you're grumbling about doing it. You better enjoy freeing yourself. Enjoy freeing yourself. Thank you for making the investment tonight for coming through. And I hope, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm very confident that you guys took something away from tonight's discussion. I know I took it away. And I want to let you guys know that I'm the type of journalist that that likes learning along with the audience. You know, it's, it's not about having all the answers and coming in front of y'all like, I have all the answers. That's that CNN, MSNBC, foo-foo stuff. The split screen, everybody barking back and forth, but they're both wrong type stuff. What type of stuff is that? You know, real journalism is admitting that you don't have all the answers, and then you go on an experience to find those answers, and then the audience goes along with you, right? And then you guys are learning, right? And then it's an exchange. It's an exchange. You know, a brother told me about uh, pedagogy of the oppressed. You know, it's in this, you know, it's in this, um, it's in this facility here. And I encourage you to get it, as I'm going to get it because I'm a teacher. We're talking about an exchange of ideas, the same way that generations exchange ideas as the older generation is showing the younger generation how to plant seeds, you know? So we have to keep that all in mind. Can I get an ashe? Ashe. All right? So with that being said, Buy something. <laughs> Definitely. Before before I even before I even call on our last act, uh, our um before I even call on our on, on our act for tonight, I really want to encourage you guys to buy something from Sankofa. Whether it's a book or whether it's a treat from the back in the cafe. We have to support black business. Who here has bought something from Sankofa today? Raise your hand. Okay, that's beautiful. Okay, perfect. I enjoy it, y'all. I enjoy it. Alright, so um to introduce our music, our guest for the night, if you don't mind, you want to do, okay, perfect. We have Kim Poole uh, of the Teaching Artist Institute. Uh, she's going to come up and introduce uh, our, our guest for the evening. For those uh, who aren't aware, the Teaching Artist Institute and All Eyes on DC, they're collaborating. I'm a Riven People pundit. I'm speaking about. I'm speaking about artistry, right? We're talking about culture, artistry, music, just the communication through the beat of the drum. And that's what I've been tasked with doing, the Teaching Art Institute and All Eyes on DC. We work together to spread the message. This is a platform. These are two platforms that are used in reciprocity. So as a part of this, the Teaching Art Institute brings in teaching artists, people who teach through the arts. And tonight, um, my sister, Kim Poole, is going to introduce the teaching artist who is going to show us a thing or two. So, hold on tight to your seats and give all your attention, you know, because this segment is going to be very, very fruitful. Let's give Kim Poole a hand, y'all. First of all, clap it up for Sam because he's an amazing group. You need to take us on that journey. You need to tell what you're learning with us. And um, that kind of empowers us. We feel like, oh, right, I'm at the table, decision maker, right? Um, before I start, um, and before I say anything about the Rhythm People campaign, um, I just want to thank you for the platform. Um, and I want to thank all of the guest speakers. Clap once more for them. I learned so much in my mind. I'm a foodie. Um, and in the spirit of tonight, uh, I just want to give a donation to the crowd of seeds. Um, the Teacher Artist Institute, we encourage everybody to put your hands in the dirt. It's about motor muscle memory. It doesn't matter if it ever grows, if you're ever able to propagate the seed. Um, you know, if you're not able to do it, if you start um, becoming more comfortable, being in that environment, um, leaving this concrete jungle and finding those green spaces that are facilitated by our master gardeners, 
Um, I, I think that it, it creates in you a yearning to know more. And so before we bring up Miss Christina Cook and she introduces her amazing program, The Rhythm Key, we just want to encourage you in the spirit of the night um, to find the rhythm in the roots. So I'm just going to take a moment and pass these out. Can I get an assistant? Anyone? Thank you, Sam. Um, please take as much as you want. I mean, all kinds of seeds there, flower seeds. Uh, pumpkin seed, um, any kind of seed that you can think of for a pepper. Take as many, oh, don't be bashful, don't be shy. Take seeds, there's plenty in that bag. I mean, just, it doesn't matter if you ever really fully grow the seed, but get in practice. We need to remind ourselves of what it feels like to be in those environments. Um, so again, I'm Kim Poole, as they do that. I'm with the Teaching Artists Institute. Um, we're, uh, we're training artists to use their art to advocate for the causes that they care about, as well as fuse their art form with an area of social transformation. I'm here because art is more than just the aesthetic. I'm a soul fusion teaching artist, and um, so I sing. I, that's, that's my art form. But what I said is that, you know what, it's more than just about me and my song. Um, what is it that the other art forms give to the cultural narrative of our community? Uh, Christina Cook is a perfect example of being a product of her circumstance. I have been knowing Christina Cook since I was 14 years old. You couldn't have told me when we were 14 that we would be sitting here in this room together tonight. Um, it, it's an amazing full circle journey and we're still on it. Um, in a lot of ways, the heartbeat is the, the foundation of who we are as people. Something that teaches you and reminds you, um, whether you allow it to or not, it reminds you of your primal heartbeat. We have an oath um, in our Rhythm People campaign. We say, in the beginning was heart drum. With this vibration, we give rhythm to the world. On this beat, we sing life. We are the Rhythm People. If you can truly embrace the heartbeat, if you can truly embrace the beat of the drum, it is the best form of communication, internally and externally. When you silence yourself from the, the noise of this urban jungle and you listen to that heartbeat within yourself, it realigns you with your destiny, with the trajectory. It helps to realign us as a community, one heartbeat and one sound. So um, with all that being said, I'm gonna bring up Miss Christina Cook. She's one of our senior fellows. We've been in existence for almost two years now, and she started this journey with us. Her or amazing organization, The Rhythm Key, is, um, well, I think I'll bring her up and let her tell you about that. Meanwhile, I want five people to raise their hands in the audience right now. Five people, brave souls, brave souls, okay. This, this elder, younger here, is um, raising his hand. Thank you very much. We have this sister here, and I, I think that's, a raise, okay, we have three, I need two more. I have one in the back and this sister here. And I need you all to come up to the stage and bring your chair. Yes, you are a part of the show. Don't be shy, don't be bashful. Come on up, come on down. Yes, thank you very much. Clap for them guys as they come to the stage. Give them a little motivation, I mean, they're doing something they don't know what they're about to do. But what we're gonna do is show them how sound, the beat of the drum sound, it's not something that you need. This, see this beat that happens inside your chest? You don't need to be an expert to tune into that. It's something that happens to you, it happens through you. And we're gonna demonstrate that right now. But before we do that, Christina Cook is gonna talk about her amazing initiative, The Rhythm Key. Peace, family, how y'all doing? Good, peace. I'm trying to see where I'm to stand. I don't want to be in front of the anybody but um thank you sis yes my name is christina cook and i'm from baltimore maryland and i found i'm the founder of an organization called rhythm key and i'm sure a lot of you have seen my daughter kind of bouncing around singing songs eating pretzels up here at the front of the stage oh. um yes she's precocious she sings she's been singing since she was in my womb music is her first language i don't know if any of you are familiar with anyone, you especially on the autism spectrum, but my daughter is definitely on the spectrum, and she communicates in sound, okay? A lot of people think that people on the spectrum, people with neurological challenges, don't communicate. They say they can't speak, they can't talk, they can't look you in the eyes, they can't express themselves. They have whole documentations, I have a 40-page assessment telling me all the things that my daughter can't do. They said she can't 
form sentences, write her name, but she can sing. She's been singing since she was four months old, and she communicates in rhythm. So, with that being said, knowing that I have 40 pages assessments in my house that tell me that my daughter is disabled, and knowing that I'm raising a musician who communicates in sound, that gave me the, um, that planted the seed for me to really find out what tools our youth need to express who they are, to communicate to us effectively, not just who they are, but how they learn. Because we have a whole generation of, of youth that are, are suffering, being shoved off the edge of a cliff, being told that they can't learn, and that they can't talk, they can't sit still, they can't function. So with Rhythm Key, we really, I mean, you all are up here, you don't even know what you're doing up here, you just kind of came, you don't know each other, I don't think, do you? Sound a, Sound a little bit, a little <laughs> bit. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if you ever played a drum with each other, though. Maybe you've had conversations with each other, but that's a different conversation. Words are different <laughs> rhythm. We communicate in different ways, utilizing different tools. Some of us are extraordinarily eloquent, and we can communicate effectively utilizing our words. Some of us are not, but we still utilize appropriate tools to communicate who and what we are and what we're feeling and what we need to express. So words are not the only language that we can have. That's not the only communication that we can have together. So in our Rhythm Key workshops right now, we host two of them a week in Baltimore. Hopefully we'll be expanding soon. But we utilize drum circles as the foundation of our workshops. So we sit together just like this. We're family friendly and free. We are free because we don't want to charge families to come and participate in our workshops because there's enough of that already. And there's so many families who are not able to communicate with each other, to reach the appropriate therapies they need to benefit themselves, to benefit their families, unless they have a certain financial means to provide that for themselves. And it's, it's astronomical. Most, most average families cannot afford fifty to $100,000 a year to provide adequate education for their children or to provide therapies for their children or for themselves or additional diagnosis for their children. So we're trying to engage the community to provide these services for us and our own kids. Yeah. Self-funded. Yeah, clap for free. Clap for free. Yeah. And don't give us your money. Yeah. <laughs> stay free. We want to stay free. There's, there's so many things I have to turn down because I don't want to charge my family to come and participate in, in learning how to communicate with one another. There's enough division in our families. We should be able to come and participate in something as simple as let me explain how I feel. Let me talk to my mom and dad and my siblings about my day. Maybe you can't do that just, you know, how you doing today? You know, maybe, maybe you can't respond to me with words and say fine or I'm having a rough day. Or, you know, somebody got a fender bender, or, you know, my hair is not as fly as I would like it to be today. And I just, you know, I'm having a rough one. But maybe you can say that through that drum, though. If we're the drum circle, and your rhythm plays off my rhythm, and I communicate based on what you express to me. And it's really quite magical, and I had a, a few families I wanted to bring with me tonight so that you all would be able to witness the magic that really just happened. When you take nonverbal children and put an instrument in their hands and they communicate with their family and friends for the first time, it's it's just it's powerful. So we want to create as many of those powerful experiences as we can, not just for the youth, but for ourselves too. Because we need to be the ones who know how they learn so that we in turn can teach appropriately. They are our greatest teachers. So they are now teaching us that these linear Aww. systems of learning are just not appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. They're not playing into it, they're not picking it up. Mm -hmm. So we need to stop trying to force it down their throats and we need to teach them the ways in which they learn. So one of the ways in which they learn is most certainly through percussion. We love percussion. So um, yeah, we, we do a lot of rhythmic activities and I think Kim's gonna help me out do some rhythm reading with some rhythm so you guys can have an idea of why we do what we do and how simple a percussion instrument can really expand your own communication, whether you're verbal or nonverbal. So I'm gonna give it over to okay. Absolutely, clap for Christina Cook. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
amount of energy. I mean, just the fact that she's here tonight, this is not even an environment that's conducive to people that are learning on the, you know, on the spectrum. So the fact that she brought this here because there is rhythm in our roots. We just want to appreciate the sacrifice, the great sacrifice that it was to come, you know, with no funding, even for her workshops that she does weekly, and no funding for coming here tonight, but making sure either way that it was necessary because there's so many of our young people that have been misdiagnosed. So to give you an, ass an assim assimilation, I think that's how we say it, right? You're the elder younger assimilation of what it means to communicate and not be able to communicate verbally. See, I'm a, I'm an artist, I'm a musician. You guys are gonna find a beat together without communicating. You're gonna close your eyes. Everybody do it now, close your eyes. Yes, you're gonna reach for the drum because the drum is just not right in front of you. You have to feel where it is. And you guys are gonna beat for two minutes straight. For two minutes, you're gonna create a rhythm pattern, a, rhythm, a rhythmic pattern together, collectively. And you're gonna do this without communication. And we're gonna watch as an audience how it comes into sync to demonstrate to you how people that communicate differently, that are differently abled, come together and use instruments to communicate messages to each other based on how they're feeling. You guys are gonna tell us how you felt today. You guys are gonna tell us maybe what was on your schedule today. This sister in the lovely pearls with her head down to the side, I think she did something really important today, guys. You guys are gonna tell us what you feel and you're gonna do it collectively using one sound and you're not gonna communicate to each other, you're gonna use these drums. So you can start whenever the spirit feels you and we're gonna tune right on in.
um, feel the tension in the drummer next to you? Do you felt like you guys were communicating without using words, without using signals? Did you feel the beat? I did. Yeah, I, I definitely feel like we were communicating. But you had to respond to how the other people were drumming to see where you could get in where it would still be har make a harmonious sound. Anybody else? I appreciate that it took me outside of my comfort zone. Like, it made me examine myself. It took you outside of your, your comfort zone. What do, you, what do you mean by that? Because my eyes are closed, so I can't see what's happening around me. I'm not in, I'm not fully in control. Like, like how we, in our daily lives, all of us be fully in control. Like, it's kind of like surrender. Like wow, I think that was so, it was so important what you just said, that it took you outside of your comfort zone. Closing your eyes, being outside of your comfort zone. Now you understand what it's like to communicate, um, for someone to communicate that's on the spectrum that is differently able, because they step outside of their comfort zone every single day, every single moment, and communicate with us. But how uncomfortable we are closing our eyes and feeling that natural beat. But every day they close their eyes and they feel that beat just so they can come a little closer to communicating with us. That's the beauty of the drum. Always find that heartbeat, not just with people that are differently <coughs> able, but with anybody that you communicate with. Make sure that you step outside of what it means to be comfortable for you and communicate using that heartbeat, that first drum. In the beginning was heart drum. With this vibration, we gave rhythm to the world. On this beat, we sing life. We are the rhythm people. The rhythm is in our roots. The rhythm is in us. Thank you guys very much. I'm Kim Poole. I'm with the Teaching Artists Institute. And clap for all of our participants that came up here so uncomfortable. Sam, I'm going to turn the floor back over to you. Clap for Sam. Thank you, Kim. Very appreciative of all that has happened tonight. Um, I think that it was by divine order that we all came here tonight and that the program uh, pretty much was set up the way it was. Nothing is by accident. And I'm very, very grateful for experiencing this with each and every one of y'all. Um, before we sign off, uh, and in the usual all eyes on this fashion, I just want to encourage you guys. Yep, you need this record? Sure, thank you. Well, I'm not even going to give my spiel just yet. My apologies. We have a couple of announcements. Um, I got um, my brother, Amir Baker, is going to come up real quick. He's going to talk to us about an event tomorrow. Uh, in the spirit of uh, planting seeds and you know continuing generations. Uh, Mayor's gonna uh, talk to us about an event that pretty much, um, in a sense, is about that preserving you know unions. Let's give a Mayor Baker. Uh, round of applause. Good evening, everyone. How y'all feeling? Good. Yeah, I'm glad y'all are here. Um, it was an amazing program. I just want to give a, a little feedback on the event that just happened up here. Um, even though I didn't have a drum in my hand, I was looking at everyone individually, and you could, I don't know if you all at the front could tell, but everyone kind of had a whole nother vibe to them. You could almost read somebody's mind by the way they were doing the patterns on the drum. I thought that was kind of deep, but you know, from an audience perspective. Um, so tomorrow, um, my organization, African Unification and uh, ENVA, are having a Black Love event um, slash Poetry Slam. It's going to be a uh, dinner slash conversation piece. Um, pretty much talking about the issues that face black relationships today, um, what we can do to help preserve them, um, even talk about some topics that we normally try to shy over. Um, we really want to, you know, just kind of encourage everyone to come out and engage in the conversation, say your piece. You know, everyone has had their own personal experiences with love and relationships, and, you know, whether you've dated, you know, within your race, out of your race, whatever the case is, all these factors come into play when we talk about the preservation of the black family, the black man and woman, the black child, and you know, tomorrow's gonna be a great event. It's gonna be our second annual one. Last year was half. It was amazing for those of you all in the room who were there. And um, I encourage you all to come out, participate in the conversation. We'd love to hear your point of view, what issues you think are affecting black relationships in the community, what we can do to strengthen them, and um, you know, give you an opportunity to talk to the other side um, about how you're feeling. 
and that's it. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me tell y'all where is that. Uh, so it's going to be tomorrow from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. It's going to be straight up Georgia Avenue on Alaska Avenue. Right, it's like right off right before you get to uh, downtown Silver Spring at Northminster Presbyterian Church. It's not a church event. That's just the venue. I want to make that clear. Um, it's a completely neutral event for you know black people to come and speak freely about this topic. Uh, it's at 7720 Alaska Ave, Northwest 530, 830 tomorrow, straight up Georgia Avenue. And um, you all can follow the organization at AU underscore DMV. Um, if you need to check out the flyer, if you want to send it to anybody. And uh, my name is Amir. I'll be in the back if anybody wants to talk to me after, get any contact information. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to the host. And uh, you all have a good night. All right, we have another announcement for you. Um, a couple more. Or, well, Christina wanted to go first. I'll let Christina go if you don't mind. And then, okay. All right. Let's give Christina a hand, y'all. Hey, family. Um, I just wanted to share some. Well, actually, first of all, um, just to piggyback on what Amir said, I was at the event last year, um, the Black Love event last year, and it was very, very insightful. Very good discussion. We did talk about some things that, you know, it's important. You, there's no growth without some growing pain, some uncomfortability. So, you know, there were some conversations that a lot of times you try to shy away from or that we don't want to talk about because it might make us feel uncomfortable, it might make us feel um, vulnerable. But it's important. If we can't be vulnerable with each other, who can we be vulnerable with? Really, it has to be real community. So I definitely invite all of you to come out to join the discussion to, you know, it's a social event, so you know, we're going to talk. We have some drinks, some food, and really like build with each other and really have a good time also while doing that. But um, I actually came up here to talk about an event that's going, another event that's going on tomorrow and Sunday right across the street at Howard University at the Quad, which is one of the dorms on campus, um, on, on Howard's campus. And they're women's self-defense classes. They're free. Um, they're, it's a partnership with uh, National Black United Front and WOW, which is women's only workout. Um, and basically what we're doing is just, you know, everybody's about to go off for the summer, um, you know, do the kind of their own thing, but we really want to have a space where women can come and learn about, learn about personal security, learn about enhancing their personal security, learning about, um, you know, how to avoid kind of risk of security risk when you're out, um, you know, just figuring out how we as a community and then also as a sisterhood can really build security around each other. Um, we're also going to be talking about a fundraiser that we're doing to raise money um, to really give us kind of more tools to, to secure ourselves with. So that includes personal alarms um, that can be 130 decibels plus where if you find yourself in a situation where you might be close to people or close to a populated area but you might not be right there, you can you know use it and draw attention to the situation, whatever's going on, until you can get to a safer place. And then also that um, another thing that we're raising money for is for mace and pepper spray canisters that we can have you know when we're out by ourselves if we need to be out by ourselves that's something else we're going to talk about we really shouldn't be out by ourselves if we can help it um but i encourage you all to come out it's from three to five tomorrow in the quad at howard's campus tomorrow and sunday and we'll be doing some more these are we've had two classes thus far these are going to be the, the, the third and fourth classes and then we plan to do some more over the summer but come out if you know some women also you know sisters Older, younger, it does not matter. Anybody who can benefit from learning simple moves, also more complicated moves, but just just really learning how we can defend ourselves and how we can not just be kind of just out here. You know, everybody needs to have ways that they can protect themselves and ways that they can basically, you know, arm up, square up if need be. You know, we can't always look to somebody else to come help us. We have to be able to protect ourselves. So I invite you all to come out, and if you need any more information about it, I'll be here. So. Um, no culture without agriculture. Okay, let's do this real quick. Uh, for the garden of your daily living, plant three rows of peas. Can we say peace of mind? Peace, peace of mind. mind. Peace of heart. Peace of heart. Peace of soul. Peace of soul. Plant four rows of squash. Squash gossip. Squash gossip. Squash indifference. Squash indifference. Squash grumbling. Squash grumbling. Squash selfishness. Squash selfishness. 
plant four rows of lettuce. Let us be faithful. Let us be, faithful. Let us be kind. Let us be kind. Let us be patient. Let us be patient. Let us be really loving one another. Let us be really loving one another. No garden, no garden is without turnips. Is without turnips. Turn up for meetings. Turn up for meetings. I think we need to say that again. Turn up for meetings. Turn up for meetings. Turn up for services. Turn up for services. Turn up for help. Turn up for help. To conclude our garden, to we conclude our garden, we must have time. We must have time. Time for each other. Time for each other. Time for family. Time for family. Time for friends. Time for friends. Okay, repeat this bit. We are not Africans. We are not Africans. Because we were born in Africa. Because we were born in Africa. We are Africans. We are Africans. Because Africa, Africa was born in me. Was born in me. We are not Africans. We are not Africans. Because we were born in Africa. Because we were born in Africa. We are Africans. We are Africans. Because Africa, Africa was born in me. In me. That is from the first president of the Federal Republic of Ghana. Osajifu Kwame Nkrumah, which some of us remember that uh, roughly the 7th of March was the 60th anniversary of the Federal Republic. And so when you have some of your nice friends from wherever it is in the world, even if they're from here, you're not African because you were born in Africa. Whosoever you are, you are that because that was born into you. Ashe! Ashe! All eyes on DC family. Once again, very happy to have had you here tonight. If you haven't had a chance to, please sign the sign-in sheet. The sign-in sheet, once you sign it, that puts you on a listserv, I promise. Not to bombard your email inboxes with, you know, just trivial stuff. This is a way for me to keep in contact with you and vice versa. All right. Uh, next month, we're here on the third Friday. Once again, we have a different theme. I'm not going to tell you what it is tonight because I'm pretty confident that you'll be back to see what it is yourself. You know, uh, as always, I'm very, very happy to be here and to really talk to you guys about what needs to be done for African liberation pretty much. And I'm happy to have you guys here. Like I said before, this is an experience. We're exchanging knowledge. And tonight, you know, this counted among one of our best shows because we took it back to the roots. Literally, all right? Let me get an Ashe family. Ashe! Let me get one more Ashe family. Ashe! You guys have a beautiful night. Stay beautiful, beautiful black people. Love you.